I'm Michael Kelleher, Director of the Wyndham Campbell Prizes at Yale University. Welcome to the 2021 Wyndham Campbell Prizes Virtual Festival. We'll be streaming a new episode each week for the next nine Wednesdays. Each episode will focus on one of this year's prize recipients, and the final episode will be a keynote address by U.S. Poet Laureate Joy Harjo. While the episodes stream, you'll be able to chat with other audience members, and following the live stream, we invite you to join the writer in a live Zoom Q&A. In the week between each episode, there will be plenty of on-demand content available for you to enjoy. Today's episode features playwright Nathan Allen Davis, author of Nat Turner in Jerusalem, as well as the Refuge Plays Cycle. The episode was recorded at the New York Theater Workshop, where Nathan was joined by Philip James Brannon, Rebecca Smonga Frank, Jack Phillips Moore, and Omolulu Fiki for a staged reading and conversation about what it's meant to lose the stage during the pandemic and what it means to return. So I think we should first introduce ourselves. So I'm Nathan Davis, I'm a playwright. Uh, why don't we start with Omalolu over here and go around? Hi, I'm Omalolu Fiki and I'm an actor. I'm Philip James Brannon, I'm an actor. I'm Rebecca Samaga Frank, I'm an actor, also write and direct. Uh, I'm Jack Phillips Moore, I'm a dramaturg. Thanks for coming here to the York Theater Workshop. Us. Yeah. This place. And I want to start, you know, this moment here in August of 2021 as we sit and talk. I haven't been to New York for a minute. <laughs> I, I moved to Princeton a year ago. And I was thinking about just what it means to sort of return mm -hmm. to the theater and thinking about the future and thinking about our art form that we work in and what we do. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna be honest and say, like, I am struggling, struggling a little bit to know what it means to sort of like be back mm -hmm. at this time. Mm -hmm. Um, for a lot of reasons, and I'm just curious how you all are feeling <laughs> from your various perspectives. Because I think, like as a as a playwright, I'm like, yeah, I can kind of chill and write, waiting for things to happen or not happen, feeling very alone a lot. But I haven't seen you all in like so long. Um, <laughs> although I met you recently in Tennessee, like we did theater together actually right. at a place. It was a Sewanee Writers Conference. Yeah. And it was this magical moment. And I was like, this is theater again. Yeah. I was so excited. What have you been thinking then or since then? <laughs> I mean, like when, at Sewanee, it was so magical. And the last time that I, I did theater was the last conference that I went to before the conference I went to right before that um, in 2019, right before the pandemic. Um, and then I, so it's been like, it was amazing. It was amazing doing like just being around that many people being in front of an audience, a live audience instead of, doing a self tape, mm. <laughs> you know, with no one else in front of me, um, using like not having to use a virtual reader, <laughs> actually having a live real audience. That was, it was a little nerve wracking in some ways because I mean, I remember when I was doing one reading with an actor that we went to school together, I was like, I can't quite like look at the fourth wall just quite yet because it felt, it was very overwhelming. All of that, all of the energy that I'm, you know, it's been a year, a year plus since, since doing that. It's, I mean, the words, like, how do you even talk about talk about that feeling, you know, and then reading your work and actually being on a stage, <laughs> you know, that was, and having, you know, it's, it's a relationship with the audience, right? So you have like your actors, but then the, the audience is like, you know, the, the third component of that relationship and just having the audience respond and, and laugh. And it's just, it was quite magical. Mm. It was magical. And I, 
I was like, I really, really miss this dearly. And also, I guess, because when I graduated, I've been on, you know, I've been on the West Coast. I've been in California. So even just kind of being in New York now here, it's been a minute, Mm. you know, and like, you know, I saw one show and fully produced and everything since I've been in New York and I cried. (laughs) I cried. It was, Mm. yeah. Um, It definitely just puts, you know, things in perspective and just putting, you know, not taking things for granted and, um, yeah, not taking it for granted and maybe a way and appreciation in a way that I probably did take for granted. Like, you know, in school, I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm here. I get to do this. Great. But then when you can't do it, you're just like wow, this is such a big part of my life. Mm. And I love it so much. Philip. Nathan. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, you remember being in an Ifa Baeza play called The Battle of Emmett Till at the Goodman Theater? Of course, yeah. While you were in that play, I was in the show at the Goodman called Gas for Less with Brett Nevue. Upstairs. So I remember watching you, like, Walking down the hallway, but I don't think we actually ever met then. Mm-mm. But I was like, Philip James Brand is an amazing actor. Who's like, <laughs> I was like in the ensemble with like a little part. That's so nice of you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so well. But like even back then, that was in Chicago. What year was that? Two thousand five. Should I even say the year? <laughs> no, because wow. I wasn't even out of college. I think it was like two thousand eight. That's so, right. Yeah, two thousand eight. Must have been because I was yeah I was in college then I don't, even, I don't I don't know time anymore, so that's great. So, um, yeah, doesn't yeah. it? But but you came to New York, and I saw you in that play, but didn't know you. And then when I met you as a playwright, I was like, oh, I saw you as an actor in this right. show. I forgot we were running at the same time. Mm-hmm. And I specifically was like when I was doing my Nat Turner play here in this room at New York Theater Workshop, I was like, Philip, <laughs> can you do this? <laughs> And it was a dream come true um, to work with you on that. And you're, how have you been? And what are you, you're in a Shakespeare in the Park production now. So you're mm-hmm. doing real theater, live. Uh, sorry if that sounds, I don't know. Real theater. <laughs> you're, doing <laughs> live, you're doing a lot of theater for, for people in, in the same general area. How does that feel? And how have you been dealing with this this time i mean it's surreal but uh i'm grateful i think that's like a word everyone's been using a lot and we say it when we circle up before the show every night everybody like breathes in gratitude Mm -hmm. (laughs) and we say it every single night and i know that word has probably become a bit of a cliche to a lot of people now like saying how much we're grateful you know expressing gratitude but i don't really think gratitude like actual gratitude can be a cliche <laughs> mm-hmm. so i really appreciate that we do that every night because we didn't get to do it for 15 16 months and there have been a lot of crazy you know covid compliance protocols we've had to adhere to and then crazy heat wave weather and just a lot of actors getting injured actors you know getting covid it was a lot going on in the show you know and we're still going but mm-hmm. we get to do a show and uh, and to go back to actually, you know, wh- wh- you, when we met, we saw each other in those plays, but then I actually came to a reading of yours. It was the sure. trilogy. Mm-hmm. What was the Refuge Plays, yeah. Yeah. Refuge plays. I was like, so it was a dream come true to work with you because I saw those plays and it was it was a, a long event. It was like three <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was There long. were three plays, you know, but they provided food. It was but it was I mean, it was so, so special. And your words were so special. And it was the same, you know, getting to work on that turn. And I, and I talk about it. I was like, to this day, it's still my favorite thing I've gotten to work on. Um, but Merry Wives is fun. <laughs> I was like, we are having a great time with Merry Wives in the Park. It's a big cast. I remember the, the first night that we had an audience. It, it, was, very, it was very surreal. Mm. And, you know, just you're like, there are people. There are people here, you know, and some have masks on and some don't. Um, but you, you know, you could just feel the energy. Every, the energy. Everybody was just so happy to be there, and mm. so I think that in 
there's this feeling of people wanting things to go back to normal. And then I feel like there's another camp of people that are like, it can never be normal again. <laughs> and I think that, I think that's sort of more true. You know, we're, we're, we're doing it differently, but we get to do it and everybody's sort of adapting. I think I'm really excited to see just the kind of work that happens in the next year or, or two. You know, we've all gone through this collective, collective experience together. And just to see what as artists we, you know, how we how that's translated and manifested in us is going to be mm. really interesting to see like what stays the same and what actually changes. I know at the public, you know, there's been a lot of talk about approaching things differently and not doing things, you know, like we used to do. Mm. And you know, and I think you know, people, some people are making a good effort at that in general, and some it does feel like things are kind of falling back to the way they used to be a little bit. And mm. I and I think that we should definitely resist that. Mm. It was like, I'm trying to be really sort of discerning about the things that I'm a part of, just, mm. you know, because yeah. the world is different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The production of Mary Wives, is this the one that Jocelyn Bio is adapting? Yeah, she, uh, she's like made it, uh, it's set in Harlem, mm. you know, uh, modern day, you know, there's uh, like African American characters, mostly, you know, characters, you know, uh, within the African diaspora, like my character is supposed to be Liberian and there are, you know, characters who are Nigerian and Ghanaian, you know, people, the artists won't necessarily know those different dialects, but it's like the whole neighborhood is there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if people have said, you know, I live in Harlem, people have, who've come to see the show are from Harlem and they say, they're like, I feel like I'm on 116th uh, Street, you know, and mm -hmm. the set is beautiful, the costumes are gorgeous and it's an awesome adaptation too and it's a very hard play mm. and like no one ever does Merry Wives I think the last time the public did it was in 1996 <laughs> probably for good reason <laughs> um, but her adaptation is, is so accessible and and fun and joyous which is what people need mm. well speaking of neighborhoods Rebecca you're back in the South Bronx but you spent the past year in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. We were just talking about that. And I should also mention that you also assistant directed Nat Turner in Jerusalem here in this room. And so we had that. That's, that's how we met. That's how we met. Megan Sembrunzakian. Mm -hmm. And we came together and mm -hmm. forgot how to talk again. That's fine. Magic. Magic. Um, but you spent the last year in Tulsa and I wrote a play about about Black Wall Street in Tulsa, and we were just talking about how we need to talk more because <laughs> I'm now working on uh, creating a TV series about, about Black Wall Street. And uh, it's such a rich story. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how your year was and how your time in Tulsa intersected with theater or not, and kind of where you've landed mm -hmm. now. Mm. Oh, so much, so much. Um, I guess first it's like so much gratitude to be back in this room with the two of you for one of the most meaningful, like reflecting on one of the most meaningful experiences I ever had in theater, which was the year after I graduated as an actor down the street at NYU. Mm. I was like lost. I just had no idea where I was gonna go and how I was gonna make it and how I'm gonna be six foot, you know, black Jewish me out here with whatever I was going out for. And, and then this opportunity came, I walked past this theater and it was like, Nat Turner in Jerusalem. And I was like, black Jews. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, Jerusalem, Virginia. Like, no, no, but it no, turned but out, yes. <laughs> but it turned out that like someone I knew was directing it. And then the next week I got an email that she was looking for an assistant director. And I just took it as a sign. And we ended up in the same room and one day as I was like sitting on the high bleacher watching, you know, Philip deliver Nathan, uh, your words, mm -hmm. I felt Nat Turner speak directly to me and directly to the moment that we were in. And it changed me as an artist forever. I fell in love with theater again and then I booked a show and just stuff happened. So massive gratitude for that. Mm -hmm. Um, and then let's see, Tulsa, the pandemic was the first time since being in New York that I had permission to leave New York. And then an opportunity came for my partner and I to just be in Tulsa and work remotely. And, um, 
it was both, it was like the freedom I was looking for from the sort of oppression of the survivalist mm-hmm. vortex here of like, you have to stay. If you leave your failure, like theater is here, you know, you need to be here. And uh, I was able to write more and just develop other parts of myself, really like vulnerable parts of myself. But, um, but I also missed and felt very isolated from mm-hmm. what we do. Like there wasn't anything to replace that. There was just Zoom. Um, so some of the things that I feel like kept me afloat were writing and sometimes writing about where we were, um, which was to just go and be in a place for me and just feel what it feels like to be there. So like going straight to Black Wall Street, mm. going to Greenwood Avenue and just seeing what's there. And there wasn't a lot. I expected there to be more of like, um, I don't know, just like people and energy, but it felt like what it was like, I imagine, when it was all cleared out. Mm. Like it it was kind of Mm. a ghost town. There's, you know, a couple restaurants. There's like those shops that are a shop, but they're closed. You don't even know when they open. Mm. There's like stuff on the, you know, paper over the windows. Mm. And then there was one coffee shop and a gallery. And those two became my home base for community you know, meeting some women in the gallery and being like, we want to start a book club. And now we're reading like bell hooks all about love, you know, and just Mm -hmm. coming and meeting in our masks and creating some of the vibe and energy of theater Mm -hmm. just through, you know, being trying to connect over Mm -hmm. words and over history and just being in a space that's like, where's the life here? We know there was this thriving life. Where's the life here? Um, and that culminated in the, the centennial celebrations and memorials and people coming from all over the world to come and observe this bit of history, which I felt like also calls back to the play, Nat Turner, Jerusalem, which was like, we need to look again. We missed some things. There's texts and documents and, uh, historical and pictures. I mean, seeing some of like the postcards that went out at that time, you know, just, horrific images that I feel like are important to see. Um, yeah, mm. just really, really important to to look mm. and to just feel and walk and then, you know, have these stages pop up and music and things to like, you know, reclaim. Mm. Um, but I did learn that it's like Black Wall Street lives and it lives inside. It lives inside of everybody mm. um, that's connected to it. And we have a blueprint to recreate it. We are the ones who recreate that Mm -hmm. epic abundance within each of us by connecting with each other Mm -hmm. and helping support each other's businesses Mm -hmm. and entrepreneurship and like, like the veins of it uh, Mm -hmm. live in us. Um, so that, that Mm -hmm. is something that I'll take with me for Mm -hmm. sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jack. Hi, Nathan. How you doing? I'm all right. Um, so when I, when I came to New York, I feel like, you know, you, you, you saw the same trilogy that Phillips saw, I think a different reading, yeah. but you asked to meet with me and you and Jesse Alec at the public, um, you sort, both of you sort of, uh, I don't know if you realize it, but you kind of, <laughs> kept me afloat <laughs> for a while because I had come to the city, you know, and I have three kids and I was living in one bedroom apartment and, um, you know, my wife and I were kind of trying to make it work and I'm like a playwright and what's happening? <laughs> what is that? Um, <laughs> what is that? Yeah. I'm like, you know, a lot of things were going well, but also it was a real struggle. And I think I had this sort of very difficult awakening into the realities of, I guess the industry or the profession is what the, what the reality was. I've been, I feel like there's a necessity for artists to sort of live on dreams for a, a while, maybe for uh, forever, a little bit. I mean, you know, you have to sort of fuel yourself and a lot of it's aspiration and a lot of it's, um, you know, putting the blinders on and being like, go, go, go. And I think I reached a point where I was like, but can I go anymore? And um, I don't want to say it was solely you, but you you were a big part of, of just keeping my spirits high because of your advocacy and your, um, your 
willingness to like try to open doors for me. And I think if you don't mind kind of being a stand in for kind of literary managers in general, <laughs> <laughs> because, because it is this community of people who just yeah. sort of guard playwrights. And I've had the fortune to, to know so many, um, wonderful dramaturgs and literary managers that have just helped me in a, a lot of times like in ways I don't even know about, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could talk about what it's like being an artist is kind of like exists to be in service of others. And I guess in a certain way we all are, but as a dramaturg and as a person who's working, you know, for an institution also outside of it, what has that this time been like for you? And like, what are you thinking about, you know, as you move forward in your Life. Yeah. <clears throat> well, first of all, I mean, I just to just to say, when we met, I was also very new to I had just moved back to New York and had somehow found my way into like an entry level job at the public. And after a couple of years, I, 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 I somehow like conned my way into the literary department, which is always what I had wanted to do. And so when we met, I was like fresh in that job. So I was also like, what is this world? <laughs> um, a little bit. And when I saw, we were talking about this, the first time I met you was I, I, I went to like the end of term Juilliard presentations. You were graduating Juilliard and there were like excerpts of all the plays, of all the graduating playwrights. And there was a, uh, y'all did a scene from um, Protect the Beautiful Place, which is the first play of the Refuge Plays trilogy. And it was like, a lightning bolt hit the top of my head. I was so in love with it. And then like very awkwardly went up to you at the reception. It was the signature? Yeah, the, 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 right. yeah. yeah. Went up to you and then there's like, you know, the wine and like cheese plate thing. And I just like <laughs> grabbed you. I was like, you don't know who I am, but that was amazing. Like I was so <laughs> into it. And then we ended up just chatting. And, and so, I mean, I think I, I, I feel weird speaking for like everybody or anybody else that does the job of a literary manager or dramaturg or new play advocate for a living. But I will say that one quality I think a lot of us have is that we're very excitable and we really, really love plays. Mm -hmm. And when something like your work like walks into our lives, it is the most, it makes us feel less alone. Do you know? So it's not, it's not like this, like, oh, we're here to like, you know, help people and shepherd them. It's, it's, it is very much an exchange of vulnerability and intimacy in this weird way. Like something was in that excerpt of that play that I needed in that moment. Mm -hmm. And I felt that way about, about all of your work. Um, the pandemic has been <laughs> weird for everybody. Um, you know, what was it? March of 2020? Mm -hmm was when Broadway shut down. There was that one day where I was just like, no one's performing tonight. And then that was it. And then every one by one, including the public theater where I work, and it just felt like it all closed down so fast. And, and there was just this immediate wave of despair and fear, not just because like we still didn't know what this virus was really and what it was about to do to us, but it was like, we don't know when we're coming back. We don't know what theater is going to be like. We knew enough to know that this virus seemed oddly tailored to disrupt theater, to disrupt people gathering together indoors, breathing the same air for several hours. Like, mm -hmm. so one thing you weren't allowed to do um, throughout the pandemic, and it's literally the engine of what we do. Mm -hmm. It felt so crazy. And, and the other, the other sort of very specific trauma was that in an instant, thousands of people lost their jobs people who were in shows, people who were prepping shows, mm -hmm. staff members who, because of economic reasons, had to eventually, you know, be on furlough or have, you know, their jobs eliminated entirely. Every, it's just everybody was out of work and, and, and there was this loss, this mourning the loss of these beautiful experiences we had all created together. I talked to so many playwrights in the first month who just, it, you know, whose plays were canceled or cut short, um, because of the pandemic and it, it felt like they had lost a loved one. It was like watching something you worked so hard, you put your whole soul into go away and who knows when it'll come back. And then of course, because we're not producing anything, you know, we're not, normally I'm reading plays all the time and that kind of stopped too. Cause it's like, well, what are we even doing? Like, what is this? What am I reading plays for? If we don't know when we're gonna produce. 
Um, and so then I think what ended up happening was probably what happened to all of us, which is you just check in with each other. And so my relationship to playwrights for a while really just became, are you okay? How are you doing? How, how, how are your people? How are your family? And just kind of trading notes about how afraid we were, frankly. And eventually we started figuring out ways to do theater and radio plays and, and all the Zoom rehearsals that I know. I'm looking at all these actors who I've seen do you know, 10,000 uh, Zoom readings and plays. And there were beautiful things about that. And it was nice to see each other's faces, but we were all so exhausted and so afraid and scared. And you, know, you asked us, like, what are we thinking right now? And because we're kind of reopening, but Delta's still here and we're not out of the woods, you know, as Philip said, there's like a lot of talk about how we're going to do things differently and what needs to change, and that is absolutely true. I think the other thing that needs to be named is we all just went through something deeply traumatic, and I don't know that we as a collective community have really figured out how to talk about that yet. Never mind the just the physical, people have gotten sick, we know people who've died of this virus, but... The rest of us have been just inside and afraid for a year and a half. And it's, it, I think it, we, there's also something that I feel compelled to, you know, talking to about advocating for artists, there's like, I, I, I want to figure out how we look out for each other's mental health, mm -hmm. how we're taking care of each other as humans. And like, and I don't know how to do that um, because I'm also, you know, afraid <laughs> in a corner trying to figure <laughs> out what's going on. So that that's what it feels like right now is just how do we, do the thing we love while also, you know, trying to make it come back better, whatever, you know, that means to you. But also, how can we take care of each other better? Because we're not always, in the best of times, we're not always great at taking care of each other in this business, in theater. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I, I, that's what I've been thinking a lot about. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's what I'm, that's, I just that's, decided to say that's that. perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Well... My way of trying to take care of all of you is to write part of the play, <laughs> which I wrote specifically for you all and wrote your names in the script so you would know what role you were playing. <laughs> I sent it to you, and I thought maybe we could just read some of it, or all of it, because it's only five pages. <laughs> How does that sound? Good. I think so, we can handle it. All right. Let's do it. Great. Right. Right. We're gonna clear this is the, the part way. where the dramaturg goes away. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> Did I ever tell you about the factory? I love factories. The factory I used to work in? Yeah, I love it. I love you. I love me. I love that we're here. What kind of factory did you say it was? The factory I used to work in. The helmet factory, right? Yeah, the factory I worked at for like 300 years making helmets. Yeah, you worked there for so long. Like, no joke, 300 years. Yeah, I'm no. Not even joking. No, yeah, 300 literal years. Three actual factual centuries of me and these helmets. Right. <sighs> it's like, how do you even survive something like that? You don't. Right? I know, I didn't. I didn't survive it. Yeah, I mean, how could you? So I go back there, right? Uh-huh. I go back there. Yeah? Because I was in the neighborhood and the gravitational pull, as it were. Right, of course. So I go. I go to look at it. Yeah. And it's just... It's the same. Like, it hasn't changed. Did you go inside? I did. Oh no, no, oh God, oh no, I think I need to hide. Did you still have your employee ID card? This, this is a scary story. I didn't, I didn't have it. But I walk up to the door. I'm hiding, um, I'm hiding now. I walk up to the door, no card. Beep. Door opens. It remembered you. I was in the system. Were you surprised? I was and I wasn't. Yeah, they got you. Got you in this system. Mm, mm, mm. What'd you do then? It was muscle memory, you know. You talked to anybody? No. What'd you do? I worked. For how long? Like 300 more years, at least. Oh. And you just got back? Yeah. 
just this morning. Yeah, I was wondering where you were. Is the scary part over? Yeah, I mean, it'll never be over, but you're good. Thanks. Don't tell me what happened, okay? So yesterday I'm smoking a cigarette outside the wall of the Garden of Happiness. And this man asks me for a light and I don't have one. And he's like, how'd you light yours? And I'm like, I don't remember because I don't. I don't remember. All I know is I'm trying to smoke this cigarette and I'm checking all my pockets. I check them twice. No light. And he asks me if he can light his cigarette with my cigarette. And I'm not really about that because, A, I don't know this man, and B, it doesn't always work. Lighting one cigarette with another, it might work, it might not. You don't just ask someone for their cigarette to light your own cigarette. You move on. You move on and find a lighter elsewhere if there isn't one available. So, you know what he does. He just stands there. Not saying anything, not looking at me, not moving. He just stands there. And I'm going to enjoy my smoke, okay? So I finish my whole last cigarette. And then he speaks. He asks me, when you search for something, brother, how do you do it? Do you look with your eyes? With your heart, too? Do you search through the years like the right hand of the wind gently parting the leaves of the trees on your way to God knows where? That is the same thing my mother used to say to me. Like, uh, instead of a bedtime story, she'd sit next to my bed and she'd say, when you dream, my love, how do you do it? Do you do it with your eyes? Do you do it with your mind? Do you do it with your heart? Do you sift through the years like the right hand of the wind gently parting the leaves of the trees on your way somewhere. That's what I told myself on the way home, on my way back home from the factory after my second term of service, after 600 years I went home on foot and I said to myself, when you walk away from hell a second time, how do you do it? Do you walk with your feet? With your heart? With your soul? Do you sift through the years like the hands of God? Do the leaves of the trees recognize you? How do you return to a home that has changed as much as you have? What gift, other than yourself, must you bring? We're going to end today's episode with a short reading. But before we do, I'd like to invite you to a live Zoom conversation immediately following the episode. I'm going to read a selection from my play, Nat Turner in Jerusalem, which premiered here at New York Theatre Workshop in 2016. And the draft that I'm reading from is actually dated in March of 2016, before the production. And I'm sharing this one because I changed the beginning of the play. It was a good change. It was necessary to make the play function and work. But I always miss certain aspects of the original beginning of the play. And so I'm going to share that original opening with you now. Scene one. A dark, empty room with one small and high window through which a solitary beam of sunset shines. Nat Turner is cross-legged, wearing rags. In front of him are three piles of rags, 
identical to the rags he is wearing. He picks up one pile of rags. He holds them by the edges and corners, considering. He folds them with care. He sets them down. He picks up the second pile of rags. He holds them by the edges and corners, considering. He folds them with care. He sets them down. He picks up the third pile of rags. He holds them by the edges and corners, considering. He folds them with care. He sets them down. Net. Who shall it be tomorrow? Nat spreads the pile of rags out equidistantly. He closes his eyes and spins himself around, using his arm as a pointer. He stops his spin. He is exactly between two of the sets of rags. He looks at one, then the other. He is still for a few moments. He turns around and sees the third set of rags, farthest from where he is pointing. Oh, my friend, thy Lord hath not forgotten thee. Let no one ever tell you you are rags, for you are chosen. Men will mock you, saying you're weathered. But what do they know about the weather? Nothing at all. To them, it is either hot or it is cold. And they think the rain is only for the crops. Can you imagine all that rain just for crops, just to make plants grow and nothing else? Who else has warned thee, friend? Prisoners come in many stripes, thieves, prophets, false as well as true, madmen, murderers, deposed kings. I do not doubt that you have warned them all. It is sunset. Have you ever seen the sunset just like this? I did not think I'll sleep tonight, my friend. What would you do if your ship were docked on the shores of eternity and the anchor could not be lifted? It had to wait till morning. Oh, my friend, do you know how much I long to lose that anchor and hoist my sails and take to that great sea in the dead of night and bend my gaze to the horizon line where stands the gleaming city of my Lord? whose gates of moonlit pearl I see flung wide for my approach. But no, the anchor holds till morning. God's foot is on it. I can't die till morning. Forgive my soul that it stirs wakeful on the pier for sunrise. The petty devils will probably make me wait till afternoon. They want my execution with their lunch. But morn till afternoon don't feel long. There's things going on. The night, that's long. That's nigh ungodly long. Should I get dressed now? No. Morning. Morning. But stay there, friend, and take that light. Take my last sunset. Hold it for me for tomorrow. That lies down.